Since 1965, Peter Andrews has been championing an understanding of the Australian landscape that started out to be unique, but is being broadly accepted now as the way to go. I want to spend a little bit of time with Peter today, having a look at his latest project, getting some tips and some ideas about what to look for when you have a look at your landscape and attempt to manage it, and find out from Peter what are the two or three key messages he wants everyone to know when they're looking at the Australian landscape. Peter, how are you? Good, thank you, mate. <laughs> thank you, you very much for having us You need to out. teach people that they have to manage water or be taught to and let the plants take over. So, Pete, the trees in the landscape, even if they're dead, tell us a real story about what's been going on. Absolutely. Do you reckon there's a story in this tree, mate? Tell us what it is. <laughs> Just looking, see, this root here is current, well, until it died. Until it died, yeah. Then this one was a another stage of development, this one was another stage of development, this one was another one. That's getting back to when it was nearly right. And these are and these original? Two, well pretty much, that was the original water level, which would have been above here, about there. It would been the original water level. So you reckon we've lost that much water out of the landscape? Definitely. But it's it would... not just erosion, I mean we're standing in front of an eroded bank here, but if you go back through the soil, no, let me all tell of you. that water's left the soil. Yes. It would be simple enough to say that if we replaced the soil and the trees, we'd be able to replace 30 feet of water across the landmass. Well, you sit out how much that would do to the ocean. We think of Australia as a dry continent, but you reckon that's absolute baloney, don't you? Definitely. It definitely, it was the land that developed and maintained megafauna for millions of years. Millions of years before humans came along. And when they came along, of course, it started to change. We humans make an impact no matter where we are, no matter who they are. Let's go up a little bit higher in the landscape and have a chat about some of the things that you reckon we can do to easily and simply restore water to our soil. So to get back to that fertility, Peter, after intervening to take it away, we've got to intervene to get the water back, don't we? And yes. you reckon there's simple ways we can do that? Guaranteed. It's very straightforward. The fact is that because the rivers have now incised quite deeply, I've been able to take water off, as the plants used to do, they used to block the creeks and the creeks would flood out. Yes. And only the main flow would go through because the high point of the river was where the plants couldn't grow. Either they drowned in the wet time, the grasses, or they were um, too dry in the, hot, in the hot and dry times. So Peter, you with your very simple machinery, are now acting as a plant in the landscape to bring the water back up where it needs to be and spread it out. That's brilliantly said. In fact, it's very true as well. So I don't have to do more than say, if it was run by plants and the water was forced to the highest points all the yep. time, because the plants would grow so dense in the hollows where the facility was that it couldn't get through. And the very confusing piece about that, the depth of the plants meant that the water at that level created a back pressure or a wave. Yes. And that's how it, it's very complicated until you understand that it was this wave effect which you never see as the floods are happening and they come into these areas as the wave formed the water automatically back, backed up behind it. And you reckon plants were doing that in the environment all the time. Yes. And hydrating our landscape. Yes. And that's the most difficult thing that most, it took me a long time to really, I could see the patterns but I couldn't understand how the hell they were working. And then so I thought, oh, damn wave, I've never seen the wave, but you see it at the beach, of course, but then that's the wind blowing it. Out here, it's the gravity moving it, and the gravity then is affected as soon as the wave forms behind it. So it's amazing. And there's a rule of threes you've been talking about. Let's go and have a look at one of your ponds and tell us about this rule of threes. Fine. So, Peter, this rule of threes comes from your looking at the Paru system and other natural systems that occur in places like Wilcannia. And you noticed that natural water flow systems come in threes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, there's a main single flow at the minute, which is usually the highest, and then yes. there are secondary flows with the other side. So it's an amazing... So you've got a main flow, and then when it, when it reaches its highest point and flows over, there's usually two more. Yes. Right. But there's a reed bed which divided the flow up. 
So it would only let a controlled amount of water through the main channel. That's why they didn't get damaged. Yes. And the main went of what we called a floodplain. See, there was no such thing as a floodplain in the dictionary until the last few years. They were either plains or floods. But Australia, but because everyone came here, they were floodplains, and that's what they talked about. So you're recreating a floodplain here before we get to the what used to be a dam that's now a pond. Yes. As water flows across your landscape, you're catching it in three contours and you're building up a floodplain that's going to take all of the nutrients out of the water before it reaches the pond and hydrate your landscape. Absolutely. Well, it does everything, actually. This is artificially changing the melon holes and the crab holes mm -hmm. to something that you can work agriculture in. Because we used to fill in melon holes and crab holes, didn't we? Because they got in the way of machinery. Now oh, no. we've suddenly realised that they're oh, really important. Absolutely essential, essential, yeah. But I found that when I did this, because we had a lot of crab hole country, we called them crab holes in our territory. Yeah, okay. So when I had that country, I let this dry out after about 18 months, and the bottoms of them looked just like the crab holes used to look of this country. So it's actually reproducing naturally the way the artificial one worked naturally and it's working fast oh yeah paddock we're standing in used to be salt affected didn't it sure what's happened to the salt it just goes a bit deeper down and um see each time you put water in and the salt solution it's leaking from there because as we destroyed the plants they were all uh, 90 parts per million of salt so there's salt st sitting in the soil and it's an essential component and there's, in the rain events, there's always at least 60 parts per million of salt. So there's always this salt replacement material. Then what would happen, the plants would lift up what they needed, a balanced amount of minerals on the surface, and the salt would stay underneath. Well, once we upset the plants and that wasn't happening, then the salt just came out of the ground I blow every dam, everywhere we changed the water pattern inadvertently, we generally spent, caused the salt problem. So what I started to do, which you saw at the dam over the creek, put little ponds in and that just pushes the salt down again and the plants keep it up and it all works. So a little bit of intervention, not a lot of intervention. It's not dramatic intervention and it's not expensive intervention. You thought I'd put in, what did you try to tell me I'd put in over oh, there? Oh, I didn't try and tell you anything. <laughs> they were, I've they learned were, my lesson they were not rills. to tell you anything. He said they're rills. I said no, they're, they're, they're contours. Just because they're little, it doesn't make any difference anything. So even small interventions can make, make massive impacts Absolutely. on the environment Absolutely. and bring our plants back. Don't forget the plants run it. And that means they're only little fellas too, but they, and they start from a beginning and then they've got to build it all into the massive landscape it was when humans first came. You know, Tim, you wouldn't believe that this was all salt affected. I put a simple contour in, done nothing else except let the water trap there to put pressure on the water that was coming under from the storage. And you wouldn't very often see grass growing like that under a gum tree, would you? So contours, Pete, are a perfect solution to salinity problems across the landscape. And they're also a solution for building fertility. They also work well with dams and ponds. They were the most common process in the landscape. If you walk down a road and it's just rain, there's a little row of mulch on the contour. Yep. And as it grows, it extends. It starts at that point and it goes to the limit of the whole landscape. And in a flat country, which Australia is, it, it becomes even, all the more important, doesn't it? Absolutely, but it can even do it in reasonably steep country because of the way the grass is able to redirect the water and then it cuts the mulch rows, what does it? Then the plants grow through the mulch row and then that catch soil and dirt and so you end up with these contours everywhere. One Once again, easy interventions easy solutions and it's if pretty you quick. manage plants see i used to do, i always say to you blokes i've got to make you don't manage plants it won't work simply because they have to take over you just start it off because we've wrecked the water in the landscape now we have to put it back and get the plants to take it over for us and when we're talking about managing plants we're not talking about managing them with a spray bottle are we not at all Every plant has a contribution to make, just because at this stage we don't know. I have never taken a plant out. I've dealt with health and sick animals, and I had the station, this was the biggest part, 
We never had to worm immunise or anything, and the uncles would send up sheep that were dying, and they'd recover. And then when I went to Gawley, the wheels had come off. I had to use, it cost me 40,000 a year just to keep a few animals alive, about a fraction of them. So that started me as well, saying we must do something about this. Pete, where do you see all of this going? How does, how does this message grow? How do you start adopting change in people's practice on a broad scale? You need an advisory service like we've got with the motor industry or the financial industry or the medical industry. It's too complex. But you know, in my lifetime, the motor industry has gone from an old T-model Ford, which was the first production line, this is a production line, to now the solar powered drive itself. If you got in that and it didn't work, you'd pick up the phone and someone would tell you what to do. This is a solar powered drive itself landscape and we have to realise the same thing has to happen. So we need good advice that's no, it's not got to be bound done to by financial. Specialists. It can't have any financial issue. It's got to be run on the rules that those others are run on. They're people that are not supposed to have any connection to the information they're dealing with. They're supposed to deal with it on the level of honesty and process. So Peter, you'd love to see agronomists start to look at natural systems rather than just a cure in the bottle, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Well, it's not that they've got to recognise that it's the only thing that works for nothing and sustainably forever. But it doesn't mean that every piece of science we've established isn't able to be used, provided it's in the right context. So this is the foundation for the rest. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there is no question. I mean, I started, as we said, a long time ago, and like I used every chemical and I did all the advice I had and then I had animals and I never stopped injecting them and feeding them. I don't have to do it today. I've got to patch up the back. That are the best structured animals that I've ever had. And of course, when I traveled through Europe, they said the whalers were the toughest and soundest horses and they'd only been in the country for 50 years or more. So they couldn't have changed genetically. It was just the environment that did it. Pete? Let's keep trying to change the environment, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure to spend time with you. Thank you for having us to your property, and I hope that people are inspired. If you want to find out more, I have done some how-to videos with Peter's son, Stuart, on how to build contours in the landscape. But Peter, I think with simple rules and simple management and a little bit of observation, this is something that everyone can do, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, when I had it first examined, seven scientists were sent up, and then the old bloke that sent him up, Robert Somerville, said, you know, um, the world in the next 40 to 50 years is predicted to spend $360 trillion trying to solve what this old landscape solved. And instead of that making it easy, all the greedies came out of the woodwork thinking that I must have been some dumb farmer that just fell on his, on his head too often and that the property must have had it all, which it had, it did have. But it had to be rebuilt, and in the rebuilding of that, I learned the beginnings of this. But I had to come here to the most degraded area that I could find and watch it rebuilt while I was playing with it. It's been a long journey, Pete, and it's been a hard journey at times, hasn't it? Very, very tough. Yeah, I would, if, if I could find my very worst enemy, I'd give him this damn job, and I bet he'd, I'd squared up with him. People think that this can't work because they can't see where they make money out of it. In the very early days, I had a fellow Robert Somerville sent seven scientists in and I told them what I could see and why this was a brilliant old landscape that was the oldest on the planet. And so after seven of them reported to him, he said to me, do you know in the next 40 to 50 years, it is predicted the world will spend $360 trillion trying to solve what this old landscape's already solved. And of course, I think they thought I'd some dumb farmer that had fallen on his head too often. And that in fact, it must just be something in the land. So they did everything to destroy my viability and asset, because they thought if they got the property and I was pretty hard to toss over, um, they'd know how it worked. Well, they got the property, they still don't know how it works. Make sure you subscribed to his YouTube thing because otherwise a Yari will get you.